It's a kitty gang show on Scarbox Nation TV. It's the kitty gang show on Scarbox Nation TV. And we're coming to you live from CB Giddy.
It's a Kitty Gang Show on Scarbox Nation TV. It's the Kitty Gang Show on Scarbox Nation TV. And we're coming to you live from CB Getty. Giddy Gang Show on Cigar Box Nation TV. Well, hey everybody, welcome back to the Giddy Gang Show. We hope that we are we come through to you uh, in good form today. Uh, the we've been having some internet connection issues. Uh, it might freeze up, hang up a little bit, but hey, we're gonna do the best we can while we're able, right? Got Danny Woodman here, and of course Deke Caldwell over there on the other side. Uh, got some good stuff for you today. Going to start with a few announcements. Uh, Valentine's Day coming up in a couple of days. I hope those of us who have significant others have taken appropriate steps. I have not. <laughs> <laughs> plenty of time, plenty of time. Um, yesterday, February 11th, uh, would have been the 72nd birthday of my friend Charlie Boyle. Uh, you know, spoken about him and his greenhouse a lot on this show. Uh, one of the people in the room went with me down to the greenhouse mm -hmm. a many, times. many years ago. Yeah. Mr. Caldwell. It was definitely a, uh, an place, experience. place like no other. So I've got a song for Charlie. Going to be rolling up in a little bit. Uh, Danny and I are going to do a song, a mystery song. <laughs> not going to tell you what it is. We're going to see who the first person will be that can pick out what song we're actually doing. I'll be doing a little bit different version of it. Uh, we've also got a how-to segment over at the how-to bench. We've got a video lesson from Shane that he sent us today talking about developing your picking hand. We've got some new products to talk about. All sorts of good stuff. Um, but first, I just wanted to say, um, many fans, many of you out there are friends with and fans of uh, Janice Wilson Hughes, who we affectionately named J-Dub a while back. Um, she's been on sabbatical for a while, and we are running out of most of her slides, her ceramic slides that she makes. They keep selling and selling. Um, and I... Earlier today, uh, Kim had asked me, when did she say she was going to be back? So I was checking the email. Uh, it's going to be a few more weeks, um, but I had to chuckle. Uh, Janice lives in Georgia, and she write, she's been in Florida since before the holidays. And she writes that they decided to go to Florida to escape the cold winter weather in Georgia. <laughs> And here in New Hampshire, where it's been down into the single digits the last few nights, that just kind of gave me a little chuckle. Like, yeah, that, that bad winter weather down there in Georgia. Georgia that'd be tough. <laughs> Itcha. Oh, that's rough. That's rough. Um, also this week, Marty Tober stopped by to drop off some Wicked Buckers. Uh, and had a nice chat with him. Got some uh, big news in the works related to Wicked... Or, related to giddy buckers uh, got some good stuff good stuff happening with that that I'm excited about and I think once I'm able to talk more about it you all will be too at least I hope so um, tenor ukulele kit you see I'm holding a thing here this is a new thing just finished today got the strings on it I always play the same thing on ukulele because This is the Tenor Lele, the Tenor Ukulele Kit, 17 inch scale, where you build the box and the neck comes all pre-fretted and pre-drilled ready to go, and you just build an awesome sounding little instrument, acoustic electric instrument. It's got a pickup in there. So excited about that, and uh, yeah buddy. Hey, I wanted to ask, 
on the Giddy Friends of Giddy page and various other cigar box groups. I don't know if, if any of you have seen it. There's this post going around, this share going around about some guy who built an electric guitar out of his dead uncle's skeleton. Have you seen that? I saw that. It's but worth noting that the Greek have a very different viewpoint on that kind of thing than we do. Ah, is your mic on? It should be. Okay. Um, yeah, different cultures have different views on it. Uh, in my opinion, you know, the, the saying is there are no rules, right? Except maybe that one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that might be one step over the line, sweet Jesus. One step over the line <laughs> for me. But hey, yeah. Um, just wondering what people thought about that. <laughs> so uh, that's all the tidbits and whatnot that I've got. Danny, you want to lead us off with one of the ones you were thinking of doing? Mm, absolutely. Are you going to do it on that? Yeah. All right. Yep. So, Gary's uh, actually up there on YouTube. Who that? Gary DeRocher. Ah, ah, builder of the builder guitar. of the guitar. He's going to be. Thank happy. you again, Gary. Which one? Which one you leaning towards? Bob Marley one. Though. Okay, and that was in D. Yeah, it was D. Yep. I don't know if I can do that on the uke. Yep. Maybe I'll. Go Bob Marley's there. birthday was a few days ago, actually. Well, well. It was a, the sixth, actually. That's his officially recognized birthday. Ah. I think there's some. They don't know exactly what day he was born. Did he know? <laughs> No, nope. nobody knows. No, nope. I don't know. No, the record keeping in rural Jamaica wasn't very good in those days. Little song for Valentine's Day. Steer it up, little darling. Steer it up. Come on, baby. Come on and steer it up. Little darling, steer it up. It's been a long, long time since I got you on my mind. Now you are here, I said, it's so here. See what we could do, baby. Just me and you. Come on and steer it up. Little darling, steer it up. Come on, baby. Come on and steer it up. Little darling, steer it up. I'll pull. I'll blaze your fire. Then I'll satisfy your heart's desire. Said I'll steer you. Every minute, all you got to do, baby, keep it in it and steer it up. Little darling, steer it up. Come on, baby. Come on and steer it up. Little darling, steer it up. on the banjo earlier during rehearsal, I'll point out. Doing better than I would. Quench me when I'm thirsty. Come and cool me down, baby. When I'm hot, your recipe, darling, is so tasty. And you sure can stir your heart. Little darling, steer it up. Come on, baby. Come on and steer it up. Little darling, steer it up. One more time now. Steer it up. Little darling, steer it up. Come on, baby. Come on and steer it up.
hope I wasn't messing your rhythm up too much. Earlier, Danny was strumming the guitar, and I was playing it on banjo, and kind of that, I guess you could call it a reggae-ish rhythm, and I, I was having trouble getting it, because I'm more of a boom chicka boom chicka, and it's more of a... Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it reminded me, one time Shane and I, I think Shane's out there, one time he and I were out in... Los Angeles, and they were having a recording session at this this ratty little studio on the north side of of, of Burbank, wherever the hell it was. And Horace Panther was there, the bassist from the Specials, and he's trying to get Shane and the drummer into a reggae groove. And just watching that interaction was was interesting. <laughs> Actually, Shane requested a reggae song a few weeks back, and. There you go. Well, by God. <laughs> but sorry go. it's so late, but... <laughs> hey, one other one other little tidbit. Um, I do want to say hello to everybody out there. Jimbo Burt, we're going to be seeing a little video cameo from Mr. Burt here in a few minutes. Stanton Barker out there. Holy crap. All the good ones. Louis LaManna, Keith Rurick, Michael Abel, Abel, Jim Morris. I, uh, I had a little video conference with Scott and Betsy of Green Heron earlier talking about when they'll next be on here, hopefully in the very near future. Um, but uh, Scott and Betsy, they're looking to build themselves, I don't think this is a secret, they're looking to build themselves a banjo and a fiddle um, for, you know, like stage performance uh, grade homemade banjo and fiddle. So Jim, I see you're out there. I suggested to Scott and Betsy that they, um, consult with you they were wanting to consult with me and i've only built the one banjo and no fiddles um and i said we happen to have a master builder of those sorts of instruments and player of them um who might be able to help and kind of mentor them through that process so hopefully hopefully that uh can come together that'd be pretty cool and hopefully they'll be here on this stage soon perhaps as soon as i don't know right no i'm not gonna say anything so. <laughs> um, all right, so thank you for that. All right, speaking of Jim Burt, we have a video. If you remember last week, those of you who can cast your memories back that far, I have a vague recollection that we were talking about bending metal, bending metal parts, tail pieces, and such for use on cigar box guitars. And we showed a few different methods over there on the uh, on the how-to bench mm -hmm. during the what we we're temporarily calling the doing it with Deke segment. <laughs> the how-to segment. Um, but I put the call, we put the call out saying if you have methods and ways that you use to, uh, to bend metal in your shop at home, take a video, send it in, or, or let us know on the Friends of Giddy page. And Sue Messias, super fan Sue Messias, kicked off the uh, kicked off the fun. She posted, do you have that uh, photo, Nick? She posted a photo of some, a notebook page of her, her plans. There it is, Dang. floating amongst us. Um, right over Danny. Danny turned into a piece of paper. <laughs> hey. uh, but she kind of sketched out her plan using some wing nuts and bolts and two pieces of wood and some other things uh, that kind of got the process going. And then Jim Burt, our good buddy, a uh, super panda fan, Roll Tide, sat down, went out to his shop and put together a video. And we wanted to share it with you here. Here is the one and only Jim Burt. Uh, hey, guys. I've been fanning up, uh, fanning up that little jig I've been building right here. If you watched the Giddy Game show last week, he showed you a g jig he did use to bend in metal for your tailpiece. Well... My girl, my my favorite girlfriend up in California, came up with an idea, Miss Sue, uh, and I, she was thinking along the same line I was, uh, 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 using a wing nut and a boat, and uh, and put the piece right in here. I'm gonna show it to you right in here, and have another little piece of board out there. You need that where you can bend that thing. So we're gonna demonstrate how to use a bending jig with this little with this right here. So get follow me over here to the uh, my press. First thing we gotta do, we gotta loosen up the hardware. 
Now this thing is very, it don't take much but a few dollars to build this thing. And you got something, okay? All right, we're going to fly this thing in. Mark it where you want it to go first on your uh, cigar box, okay? And loosen that up just a little bit and fly that in. And what I got, I got a little mark right here. I don't know where you can see that. I'm going to move it a little bit closer. So that is the, where the bite or the bend going to take place on the piece, okay? I'm going to fly it in nice and easy. And I can get it up to the mark. I'm going to stop right there. Try to get it straight. You can. And then I'm going to tighten it up one little bit at a time. And a little bit more. And don't be, you can tighten that baby up. Now what I did with this, this I used hardwood. Okay, but you can use anything you want. Now I'm going to come over to the vise. Open that thing up. Now. I got it in. Now we got the piece right here, and this is what I use the bend with. Now watch it very closely. I'm going to start right here and float it. I'm going to take it and come on down, move my finger out of the way where you can see it, and hold it just a few seconds. Now look up on it. There you go, right there. Let me get it out. Undo it. Loosen that up. And there you go, right there, guys. That will go on the back of a cigar box or wherever you want to put it on, right there. There ain't no problem. All you need is just a few, little bit of hardware. You use the wing nut so it's faster to get it off and on. And it, use a couple little hinges. And that is how you build the little jig. And maybe next time, I'm going to show you how to take an old knife like this from the kitchen. Don't tell your wife you got her knife and how to turn it into a marking tool. All right, thanks you guys. Y'all have a good evening. Peace. Well, thanks for letting us play that, Jim. Maybe uh, if this is gonna be a regular thing, we'll have to come up with a name, like Jigging with Jimbo, maybe, or <laughs> something like that. Very cool stuff. Um, <laughs> You're very all about the uh, alliteration today. Jigging with Jimbo, doing it with Deep. <laughs> Still not sure about that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Picking with Nick. We'll work on that one. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, cool. That's a, a nice refinement of the simple little five-minute made thing that I showed last uh, last week. So lots of different good ways to bend some metal. Um, now, Dan, what are you holding over there, Mr. Caldwell? What I've got here, speaking of last week, we were talking about ukuleles. Uh, yeah, not a tenor uke. Not a cigar box, but it's one of mine. Uh, we're talking about strings and the low G, which I've never had, and uh, these strings were years old, so I'm like, hey, I might as well get some low G strings for you it. You like so. your G string a little higher than... You know, you know I, I like it hanging a little tighter. low. A little tighter, as one does. Um, so, so you said, now that's a, a, a store-bought... This, this is a store-bought tenor U. It is yep. a tenor. Um, you said it's, it's seen some hard days. Oh, it has. I had it up on top of a bookcase. Went tumbling down twice. You'd think I'd learn uh, not to store it on top of my bookcase, but uh, neck came off both times. Oh, so the neck came completely off? Yes. Wow. Yep. And that looks like zebra wood? It is. It's a zebra wood laminate. Veneer, yeah. Um, it's cool looking. Veneers came apart, bridge popped off, so yeah, it's been glued back a couple times. So back to the tuning high G versus low G on a traditional ukulele. Um, it's called, I believe it's pronounced re-entrant, re-entrant tuning where the, what would normally be the lowest pitched string, the bassiest string, on a uke is higher. So it's a high G, C, E, A. So it starts high, goes back down. So if you're used to like strumming a guitar and hitting that low bassy note, boom chicka, boom chicka. There's no boom <laughs> on the ukulele. It's more plink chicka, plink chicka. So now there is an alternate way, and Dan got a set of strings and I tried did. it out. So hit your your uh, my low G. Yeah. So his is an octave lower than mine. So mine. Uh... So when he's strumming, yeah. So, strum a little something there. So he's got that lower note there on the bottom end. Oh 
you're doing a good song too. Something about wheels. Some kind Some of kind wheels of wheel rolling. Um, let's, let's ask Shane. Let's ask Shane. Shane, what song is that? Uh, Can you play uh, Wagon Wheel for us? Oh, I've oh, heard wait. of that one. Um, so it's an interesting way. Now, why would you care about that? Um, it sound it 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 does have a little bit different sound than the traditional ukulele stringing. Um, one thing it does. Having that low G string on there means if you want to pick melodies using tablature. You don't generally think of tablature for the ukulele, but it is possible. Um, with that low G string, it expands the tonal range of the instrument. So you can play more songs in different keys using that low G string. Um, hey, Scott Heron out there. Good to see you, buddy. Before our video conference, uh, ended today. I was trying to tell uh, Scott and Betsy about the mystery song that's just still coming up and I was also going to show them this new tenor uke kit but the internet connection crapped out and we didn't get to finish. But anyway, yeah, I, uh, I'm i going to be coming up with string set, tenor uke string sets, got to, to be able to sell this kit, right? Um, but a variety that has the low G string instead of the high G, and then there will be at least one, possibly more songbooks, ukulele, tablature songbooks, uh, in the works as well. And perhaps some of them featuring that low G tuning, because I think it makes it a, a more versatile instrument. And as I said last week when we were talking about the vignette printed illustrated ukes, um, Compared to a, I don't have a, I don't have a shorter scale uke in here, I don't think. Well, this is a hobo fiddle style uke, uh, 15 inch scale. The smaller ukes to me, I know people, professionals have made beautiful music on them, but they've always felt a little toy-like. Mm -hmm. A little too small, a little too flinky breaky something that, that a kid might play. Tenor ukes, bigger, more spaced out, deeper. Um, same pitches of the strings, honestly. It's not like it's an octave low or anything. But anyway, I think they're pretty cool. So, I think I'll try to play a song for Charlie Boyle on this ukulele. I never saw a uke being played down at the greenhouse, but I'm sure if someone had brought one, it would have been welcome. Most, most anything was if it was played with a good spirit. I just put these strings on earlier today and if, if you've ever restrung a uke, you know that that nylon strings take a little while to break in. Quite a while. Yeah, quite a while. But the wound one's not, not no, quite not so, so long. Bad. The first two were wound on this. So I call this one Charlie's song and I've done it on this uh, show before. It would have been his 72nd birthday yesterday. I'll tell you of a friend of mine about his greenhouse too. Was the kind of man that you'd know if you knew. Beloved by many in these parts, he was ornery, kind, and loyal. He was a special friend of mine, the cutter Charlie Boy. Well, Charlie lived his days out by his own set of rules. Worked hard when he had to, never wasted time on fools. And those that came to love him, well, we'd stop down now and then to drink a few beers, shoot the breeze with our friend. Well, God love you, Charlie boy. You lived by your own rules, your fingers in the soil. And you welcomed us into your home through good times and bad. We never will forget you, the best friend we've ever had. Now the greenhouse, it was filled with stories, jokes, and songs. And you knew you'd be welcome if you wanted to sing along. Through the dust, dirt, and wood smoke, we'd greet our friends and kids. 
special kind of place like nowhere you've ever been. God love you, Charlie boy. You lived by your own rules, your fingers in the soil. And you welcomed us into your home through the times of bad. Shane for you where he talks about uh, picking hand, picking hand, technique, methods, how he gets the sounds he gets. Uh, it's not all just in what your, your, your fretting or sliding hand is doing. It's as much about what your picking hand is doing that gives you the sound that you want. So got about 10 minutes here of Shanery and then we'll be back with you. <clears throat> Shane Spiel and it's been a while since we've done a lesson and man it feels good to get back um, over the last month I've been giving private lessons online and it happened around Christmas time I had sold a package on stubbyslide.com where people got slides got a bunch of different things but then they got a half hour one-on-one -on -one, uh, online lesson with me and it was the first time I ever did anything like this. Quite honestly, I've always been afraid to teach one-on-one, -on -one, but after it was all done, I had a blast. Um, I had a good time talking to people, getting to know how they're playing, where they're at, what level they're at, and uh, I actually think I wanna do it more. So you may start to see um, some one-on-one -on -one classes being offered on my site um, on stubbyslide.com but that's not what this is about this is about what I learned from talking to some of you one-on-one -on -one. because I've given hundreds of these lessons on YouTube um, something went out of tune this get in there so I've given I've given all these lessons and you guys have learned how to uh, move the slide for all the other technical things that I've, I've shown you. So many of you have grasped the technical, but it still doesn't sound right. Where you're struggling to play and it doesn't sound like Shane Spiel. And I've followed what his, his left hand is doing, but it still doesn't sound like Shane Spiel. Here's the lesson and here's the biggest thing. Um, let's title this, It Don't Mean a Thing If It Ain't Got That Swing. And the truth of the matter is, what you play on your left hand is what you know in your head. The thing that's missing with so many people is their picking hand. The left hand is what you know. The right hand is what you feel. This is your heart. And let me explain. Whenever I started this whole lesson, I was going... <laughs> And, you know, just a simple blues riff. Simple blues riff. Um, 
and so many of you do it but when you play it maybe you play it like this and it doesn't sound like Shane Spiel doing this what's the difference the difference is my right hand I treat it like a drum like a drumstick uh, and personally for me I played in high school marching band in the drum line so for both of my hands to be working in rhythm that's a natural thing for many of you it's not a natural thing but I want you to get there so that it does become that what this lesson is going to be telling you is forget about this hand for a while and if you're sitting around watching TV just hanging out um, sitting on the back porch having a cigar and you want to practice your cigar box guitar um, and this is especially for people to play with a pick uh, if you're playing finger style this isn't going to help you as much but if you're playing with a pick learn how to get that pick comfortable in your hand uh, for me I'll give a little close-up here boom okay this pick I just hold like this you know I hold two fingers and the rest of my hand is just relaxed and I'm able to swivel my hand from side to side as I strum let me get the camera out here and now I'm gonna bring the camera down to the guitar so I've got the pick and it's relaxed and I've got it so I can strum with with my wrist second get out of there all right and so what you want to do is first of all learn what learn what's comfortable to you figure out what's comfortable to you and the way you hold your pick and you don't want to pinch that sucker you don't want to grab it hard I mean there will be certain techniques where yeah 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 you get into all that that's not what we're talking about um, you want it to be nice and comfortable in your hand and then here's the practice is to sit there without playing anything on your left hand just mute your strings and start to get little strumming patterns going like this one two keep them in a beat let me slow down And maybe listen to a song that you want to learn how to play if it's a blues song listen to a blues song and don't play anything with your left hand but just sit there with your right hand listening to it and try to mimic the strum it's a rhythm and that's what you want to do give another close up here bring that down here we go notice my hand just keeps the same pattern going So that's what a lot of you guys are missing is the feel is the feel and it's all in the picking hand and this is especially when you're just playing the riffs playing rhythm guitar stuff I'm not talking about sitting there trying to play your scales one note at a time no we're not going there I'm talking rhythm guitar I'm talking getting this right hand into a groove you want that groove to go through your body through your spine throughout your whole being because that's where a song comes to life um, whatever song you want to do um, let me change up the riff here notice this is all downstrokes for the I'm a man riff What's my right hand doing? It's
it's doing it. Close up on that right hand for the I'm a man riff. That's what we're going after. We're going after feel. So start to develop your hand by sitting there and listen to George Thorogood, listen to whatever blues you're into, but try to listen for the rhythm guitarist and like a drumstick hitting a drum to keep the rhythm, start to work on your right hand in doing that. So there's our little lesson. Um, I'm probably going to be revisiting, revisiting this a lot uh, simply because it is really holding you guys back. This right hand is holding a lot of you back to get that feel. <laughs> See, with, even with that, I'm just doing this crazy drum pattern. But there you go. There is our first, we're touching the first bass with this. Start to just learn how to hold your pick, and it's up to you. Whatever feels right for you. Some people will hold it like this. Some will hold, I don't know. For me, I just hold it like this, and I've found a real nice, comfortable area. And so that my wrist is doing the strumming, and not my arm or my hand. Um, good luck with this. Please leave comments and questions in down below and I'll check them out. Um, and also, if you want to support this channel, uh, I do want to ask you to check out, if you're watching on YouTube, you see a link for t-shirts down below. Those are t-shirts that either I designed or I had other people design cool ones like this um, that help go support this channel. Also check out stubbyslide.com. That's where I have some cool guitar slides and a lot of other neat curiosities. Uh, two new sites, poormansguitar.com is kind of like my blog for a lot of cool articles and the all new cigarboxguitars.com. Cigarboxguitars.com is the encyclopedia of the cigar box guitar. Um, check that out. My name's Shane Spiel. Thank you so much for joining me. And just remember, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. See you guys. back so there's some good how toery from mr shane spiel he's going to be posting that uh, same video on his youtube channel here in a bit later today it'll be good stuff so now we're to the mystery song portion of today's show so here's the thing i took a song a well-known song reworked it a little bit in a bluegrassy style so the challenge is and nick keep a close eye on the comments the first person to name it wins endless, eternal acclaim, glory, and fame. And chocolate. And ch well, <laughs> a lifetime supply and of Danny chocolate. And Danny will send you a lifetime <laughs> supply of chocolate. How generous of it. <laughs> All right, you ready? Here we go. I'm searching all my life.
changed up more than I thought, or it wasn't quite as recognizable as I thought. <laughs> well, Gary um, DeRozier did get it before you got to the chorus. Did he? All yeah, right. He's the good. first one to say Journey, and then it was closely followed by Laurel. Nice. Very nice. Wow. <laughs> Laurel maybe had been hearing me pract us practice it in here for the last several days, but maybe not. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, uh, taking a, a well-known song that has a very distinctive style and trying to rework it in a very different style is hard because you've got the original in your head, right? Um, highway run in the right key would be nice. Yeah. Highway run. Anyway, yeah, to the midnight sun, wheels go round and round. So anyway, mystery song. Can't promise one every week. What else we got? <laughs> All right. Two more short videos for you here, uh, one from Pornist, his truck stop diaries, and then one of some customer submitted photos of builds, and then Deke and I are heading over to the how-to bench to stain some metal, doing it with Deke. Happy Sunday morning, folks. I'm sitting here with the tenor banjo, going to do a little tune for you. This particular song was written by a Texas singer-songwriter named Jason Bolin, recorded by Jason Bolin and the Stragglers in 2001. It's called Truck Stop Diaries, and it's just a song that's supposed to be about the crazy things you see in a Texas truck stop. And being that I live in the great state of Texas and I've been to many a truck stop, it seems logical. So by the way, guys, I know for you purists out there that you're not supposed to play a tender banjo with your fingers. 
you're supposed to use a pick, but this thing is so loud, I'm gonna play with my fingers so I can sing over it. And uh, also, the word of the day is Texas. It's the first time I've had a proper noun. Hey, here you go, guys. Here's a little truck stop diaries on a Sunday morning. Well, I'm sitting here thinking and wishing and praying and I'm wondering what them folks are saying about me and what I'm doing here. They're all looking at me like I'm gonna steal their stuff. But brother, I tell you, I've got enough just to bag of clothes and tend the case of beer. Well, there's one old boy, looks like a roadie from Skinner. He's sucking down a chicken dinner. Got a rebel flag right there on his grill. And there's another, I swear, looks just like Hank stopped in here to gas up the tank. Well, who needs TV when you've got a truck stop? Who needs movies when you've got a road? Who needs a plastic car when you got the son who wants to fix it if it ain't broke? Sunday morning.
Well, hello from the how-to stage. So last week we had said that Deke would be showing you some homegrown methods for doing metal antiquing. Discoloring, darkening, rusting, all of that stuff. All that fun stuff. Aging Aging. Because, you know, if you're building a rustic style cigar box guitar, like when I build a hobo fiddle, you've built quite a few rustic style uh, instruments, you don't really necessarily want brand new shiny looking chrome uh, plated, gold plated no. stuff on there. You want it to it look... It doesn't go well. It doesn't match. So, next week, we didn't have time to quite get to it uh, this week, He'll be showing you the ways to do some of this that we're going to show today using stuff you might already have at home. Uh, but today what we're going to show is using stuff you probably don't have at home. These are chemicals specially made for uh, discoloring, treating, darkening, rusting, etching metal. Um, and I've had these for a good while and I will share with you now the company I get them from. It's called Surefin Chemical, S-U-R space F-I-N Chemical. That's also the name of their website. And they have a whole range of these pre-mixed chemical baths. They have dip style and brush-on style that for achieving different finishes on different metals. Um, so I've got a few sample things here. I've got some of these stainless steel tail pieces and they're kind of wonky because we used them in last week's That's right. bending we demonstration. That's right. nice bends in them. I have a brass tailpiece, a brass hinge tailpiece, some copper rounds, some one ounce copper coins, and then a paint can lid, which is basically treated, it's not true galvanized, but there's some kind of other metal coating on there, and then a copper slide. So, We've got some protective gear on. Yes, Deke's got with his, his, uh, his safety goggles. I've got my glasses, some gloves because these these are all pretty much acid based. They are they are made with acid uh, that if you get it on you will likely burn your skin. So you don't want to do that. I've got some water here for rinsing. Um, we're gonna have a go at this. So the first style I want to talk about is what's called a bath or a dip style. These two jars here have diluted, well actually, I think they both have diluted versions of this, Swab on Copper Blackener. This is actually from Caswell, Caswell Electroplating uh, Company, Caswell Plating. Um, and the way these work, there's copper blackening and copper chocolate brown copper. Chocolate so what I want brown. to do is take these, these are one ounce copper coins that are minted to look like real coins um, in various designs. And first I'm going to steel wool it because before using pretty much any of these treatments you want to remove any dirt, you want to remove grease and oil especially because if there's any oil from fingers, from whatever on here, that will prevent the chemicals from getting in there and uh -huh. doing the work. So I'm going to put this coin into the chocolate brown copper 20% solution. Now what is that diluted with? And how am I going to get it back out? That's an <laughs> excellent question. Um, I've got some long needle nose pliers out on my bench. That would be good, wouldn't it? It would. Well, I'm, I'll, I'll use this that. little cup here then. Because it'll be a little easy. Yeah. All right. I'll it's just diluted with water. So this stuff comes full strength and then you dilute it to the recommended dilution, 15 to 20 percent. And when you drop something in there, I found that using the diluted takes a lot longer, and if you just put it in the straight... <laughs> or dab it on, like it said, doesn't it said uh, dab on? That's dab on. I'm pretty sure that the chocolate brown one was more of a, a soak. But yeah, why don't we do some dabbing? How, how a little dab will do you. How, how does one dab? I, all right, now this, the reason they don't want you using the full strength stuff, I imagine, is because it's pretty strong stuff. This is a, a strong acid. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Ooh, it smells like, it smells like acid. <laughs> so I'm going to put down a, a paper towel. Oh, yeah. 
Let me put that lid back on until I'm actually ready. This could be the, you don't want to be this could be the show where... <laughs> Just clean it up a little bit with some steel wool. So I'm going to use a foam, foam brush and brush some of this blackening solution on full strength. Oh yeah. Now you can see, That's you, a fast can, you can't see, but Dan can see here that right away it's starting to kick in. And you can, you can go down the rabbit hole of researching the chemical reasons of why, the whys. Why does this stuff do this? I, I know nitric acid is involved in many of them. Um, so yeah. So, we've got that one soaking, and it's slowly darkening. It's getting there. And this one some age. very quickly started blackening, but then I can tell as I... Um, yeah, there it's taken it. Mm -hmm. A little bit of blue coloration to it. So there's a couple of copper treatments. So we'll just set those aside and do our best to not spill them all over ourselves. Okay. And then there are other ones made specifically for steels, different types of steels. This one is for stainless steel, because, you know, stainless, in its name, is supposed to not stain, right? right? But there are chemicals that will. And this one's supposed to give it a nickel bronze finish, which is pretty cool. I've used that before on different things. Then I've got one for steel and iron that's supposed to do an antique bronze. That one works really well. A jet black finish for steel and iron. Um, so why don't we put some of this, that onto... What do you think? Uh, buff one up. Right. One of these stainless steel pieces. Dan will... Uh, I should have brought in some more little cup things here. You can tell there was a lot of prep. <laughs> of prep for this. Well, maybe we can just pour a little bit out onto the brush. There we yeah. go. Right onto the brush. I do have a coffee mug there, but I... Oh, wait! Nick springs Look into action. Look at him go. It turns out we happen to have the perfect thing within arm's reach. Thank you, Nick. So just a, just a little bit. Yeah. Because these these bought these are eight ounce bottles and they cost about fourteen bucks for eight ounces. Um, and if you do the math quickly in your head, um, a gallon of that stuff is about a hundred bucks. So not something to just be spraying around all willy nilly. All right, ready to do some dabbing. What, all right. what was this? The black one. This is the nickel bronze. Nickel bronze. So. Different versions of these chemicals work a little differently. Some need to stay on longer. I can see the fumes coming off it. Yeah? Oh, that's good stuff. I can smell them. Just a little bit of, just a little bit of chemical love, that's all. That one's looking good. Yeah, it's getting good. And, and the good thing about the finish you get from these, that one's getting nice and dark, is some of it, when you rinse, some of it will wipe off. You know, because it, it's, it's chemically changing the very surface of the metal. It's making a, you know, some kind of plating, like a plating or just the surface. So you can always reduce the amount of effect you get. And this will go for the ones you'll be showing next week mm -hmm. by doing some uh, steel wool or a scratch pad or very light sanding or a, lightly with a brass buff wheel. There you can reduce the amount that, uh, so you just do half of it. So I did one, I dipped it pretty good. This one and brushed on a little bit and then immediately wiped it off. Yeah. So that'll probably still work a little. All right, good. On its own. I'm going to take this, this was the copper blackening, and I'm just going to put some on this brass hinge here. Uh, so we can look at how it affects brass as opposed to copper. Because we sell an awful lot of these, we drill these brass hinges with a third or uh, even a fourth hole for use as cigar box guitar tail pieces. And so being able to take that brass and quickly antique it so it looks like it's a hundred years old is kind of a thing, I think. And again, this is the copper blackening solution. 
used full strength when it's supposed to be diluted about five to one. But for the sake of time. Now I've actually never tried to use this on one of these hinges and you'll notice I did not pre-buff it. So if it's got some kind of, it's not really turning dark the way the copper did. But brass, of course, is made from copper and zinc, so it should impact it. Now, for some other things, like this uh, paint can lid, which has a, a thin coating of maybe tin over steel, I'm just going to pour on a little bit of this uh, jet black, jet black finish for steel and iron. And I brought this little brass brush out. I don't think we're actually going to... Well, maybe I'll try to... There you go. Sometimes using this while the, the stuff is on there can help it kind of get through any surface uh, oxidation and get down to the metal. But you got to be careful. Like, I'm using this with the full strength copper blackener. So if it were to flip tiny little droplets of this stuff into my face. Not so good. Not, but not good. We put that down in the bad column. So you got to be careful. I should be wearing a face shield and I'm sure our, our safety police are out there criticizing <laughs> a number of my choices. But that's all right. No, the comments are super quiet. Do as I say. They're all like, Okay, so not to do. why don't we dunk that one, Dan? This being the one he used the bronzing treatment on. Stainless steel. It definitely gives it that brownish. So it does tint. give it a bronzish, so I don't know how well you can see, but it, the bottom half there has a bit of a bronzish tint. Now the longer you leave it in, or you, the longer you leave it subjected to that solution, the stronger that will get. But yeah, it's definitely compared to the top, mm -hmm. it I, looks... Even the short amount of time that was on there, yeah, it, it, it staged it. It looks bronzed. It, it looks inherent, because it's a little mottled, a little blotchy, it looks inherently older than that brand new uh, stainless piece did. So yeah, let's have a go at this one. This is the copper, the round copper coin that we put the straight blackening solution on. And it looks quite dark. I don't know how well you it can see, does. but it was bright and shiny copper, and now it, it is not. So I'm going to dunk it in some water to dilute any of that acid that's on there. And then give it a wipe. So that etches right down into the metal, right? So that's not easily into the surface. Rubbed off. Um, different ones I've found have different degrees of longevity. Um, the ones that affect the steel and the stainless seem to be a little more uh, hardy than the than the copper ones. But I'm also usually rather impatient and <laughs> don't let them sit as long. So I'm going to come over to the camera for this so I can get a good close-up. This coin, it's pretty dark over here, isn't it? Uh, kind of shows how shiny the, it was to begin with. And then this one, you can see it, it's not bright, shiny copper colored anymore. It's dark. It looks much, much older, like you just dug it up out of a coal pit somewhere. Now let's, let's fish that, Let's try that one. Fish that, uh, that's supposed to be chocolate brown. Fish that out of there. I'm gonna go sure rinsing all. this. That's the diluted, so it's not like right. it'll burn your eyeballs out quite so fast. <laughs> It'll take a couple, take a minutes, couple to, minutes to rot them. Rot your eyeballs out. Well, that's definitely uh, got some age to it. Yeah. And again, with the steel wool or other method, you can take some of it back off. This uh, brass hinge 
got some nice darkening to it. If I had pre pre-treated it to make sure all of this, the oils and stuff were off, it probably would be a lot more even. But definitely looks less like a new, brand new brass hinge, right? All right. So this is, go. oh, boy, that looks good. And look at the back side where it didn't totally coat. And I didn't, I didn't rough up the back side. So this other, I don't know if there's a point, but I'm gonna. <clears throat> this was bright, shiny copper just a few moments ago, and now it really does have a nice kind of chocolatey brown patina to it. Um, if you've seen any old, like old large cents, the old pennies, copper coins that were made when they used pure copper, which is what this is, over time they do develop that nice brown, reddish brown, coppery brown patina. And if you just gently steel wool it, suddenly it looks like an old coin Look at that. before it looked new. So, um, oh, I was going to put a little bit of the jet black on this paint can lid. Just going to do it the old fashioned way here, which is another word for the dumb way. <laughs> Code. Use this paintbrush to just move it around to see if it has an impact on this uh, coated. Sometimes it takes a few minutes to kick in. But I've used this jet black uh, treatment on tail pieces, steel tail pieces for my hobo fiddles. They come out looking really nice. Yeah, I don't think it's going to do anything on there. Now, I've found, like, if you've got galvanized or, or uh, steel or metal that has been coated with something, I've actually had luck using one of the copper darkeners on it. Uh, Just trying to see so how steel, it does with stainless. Steel treatment on stainless. Probably not too much. I, I didn't. I didn't bring in a piece of uh, actual mild steel. That one is all rusty already. <laughs> it's so already it aged. Wouldn't show us very much. Now I did bring in a copper slot. Well, might as well brush it on. What the heck? I brought in. See, it's immediately going dark. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nicely, nicely so. Yeah. Um, I brought in this copper slide just to talk about. Like, why couldn't you use this sort of treatment on a slide? Another professional way to get color on metal is the old, old method of bluing that they use on gun barrels and similar things, which is a chemical treatment that affects the surface of the metal. A thing like a slide that gets a lot of friction on strings, you would fairly quickly rub any of that coloration back off through that friction. It would wear down through that very thin layer and expose the original metal color underneath. But if it only did that in places, maybe you'd like that look, right? Could maybe. be. So there's a lot of experimenting you can do with this, uh, with this concept of treating metal. Now, as I say, if you want to invest in some of these chemicals to do it, you certainly can. Um, next week, hopefully, <laughs> we'll, we'll have all the bits yep. gathered to show you how to do it. And Home maybe, way. And maybe you already know some ways. Uh, send us in any ideas or, or methods you know of. Um, and we'll see. Maybe we don't know about them yet, right? But yeah, it's it can add a really rustic look to uh, shiny metal bits. Oh, I also brought in a guitar tuner, one of our covered gears. It's got chrome, it, it's pretty shiny. I've had pretty good luck using some of these chemicals on these, both gold and chrome. However, the chrome and the gold plating, whatever they use, doesn't itself react very well. I have to go over to the buff wheel, or the, the wire brush on the drill press, and kind of wear down through that plating to the base metal underneath, and then that takes color, takes uh, antiquing really well. That guitar I was playing, the uh, the uh, old steamer trunk guitar, I did that on and it came out really nice. So, yeah. We're already 11 minutes over. Oh, oh. God, the brewery <laughs> it's is... It's beer time. It's time to get the heck out of here. So thanks for watching. We're going to do the... Uh,
Giddy Gang Show theme song for you, and then get the heck out of here. Hey, what's up with Danny? How you doing, Danny? How there he is. Everybody? Maybe. I'm just doing the song by myself. They're All right. Hey, <laughs> they're so far away. Just play you know. us out. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't know it by now. <laughs> um. Oh, we are still on. One other quick thing. Uh, my license plate pick plates, mini license plates. I just released yesterday a new series calling them the Cowboy States. I got Montana, Texas, Oklahoma, and Wyoming that has that rodeo uh, rider on there. Very cool design. I know they're not all of the states that have a tradition of cowboys, but they're some, in my opinion, some of the most distinctive. So a set of four for $9.99, two fifty each. That, those designs are printed directly onto the 132nd inch thick plywood, pick guards, cover plates, jack plates, pop plates, and whatever. Just decorative brouhaha. And then the other thing is, um, a few weeks back I released a, a tin of picks, 25 pick assortment, um, with a bluesman's friend design on it. This is a second variety of that called Shredder's Friend. Magic Fimber, Finger Balm makes you play like Hendrix. Oh, I need oh, some absolutely. Of that. Uh, made in Shredsville, USA. So you don't it's have to sell your soul to the devil anymore. No, that was the other one. <laughs> Blues Man's Friend makes you play like you sold your soul to the devil. Yeah. <laughs> this one just makes you sound like Hendrix with no soul sales involved. So available uh, you can buy it for $8.99, or it's one of the free gift options for $100 order level. So, all sorts of good stuff cooking around over here. We'll clean all this up later. <laughs> he said. After you, sir. He said confidently. So I challenged the boys before the show to each come up with a new verse for the Giddy Gang Show theme song. Oh, did you not? Know? We'll see how they did. I came up with one and I forgot it already. It It'll come to you as we go along. Well, it's a kitty gang show on Scarbox Station TV. It's a kitty gang show on Scarbox Station TV. And it came to you live from CB Getty. Valentine's Day is Sunday. 